Thanks very much for inviting me to, to speak at this LRC Sussex event commemorating Wapping. I'm not going to talk too much about Wapping because I was two years old when the dispute happened. Um, there are uh, people better qualified to tell that story than me, although I have learned a huge amount about Wapping over the last two weeks, helping put, to put together this Wapping special, uh, which Anne Field, who's in the audience today, um, suggested we do for this occasion. So I do hope that everybody uh, picks that up and takes a look at it, because it's, um, it's been a fascinating two weeks learning about this dispute for me. Um, Paul said that he, you know, he, he movingly spoke about how he's still living with Wapping 30 years on. And there is a sense that even though I don't remember Wapping, everyone is still living with Wapping 30 years on. Partly because every trade union defeat weakens everyone in the working class. The legacy of the, the attacks on trade union power in the 1980s and the weaker, weakening of the trade union movement have had huge consequences for all young people in this country. Um, it's a pretty minor and trivial example, but when I got my second job as a teenager at Woolworths, they still paid you um, time and a half on Sundays. Within a few months, that was taken away. That's a very, very trivial, uh, trivial little point, but it's a, it's a reflection of something which has been happening across the workforce. Um, and for young people today, they have a worse deal than their parents had. They have less secure work. They are expected to pay for safety equipment and so on that previously would have been provided by their employers. They have to pay to go to university. They are saddled with tens of thousands of pounds of debt. And of course, recently, this government has taken away even grants for the very poorest students. That is all a legacy of the trade union defeats of the 1980s, but Wapping specifically is still with us because the power of the press barons, the power of the owners of the British press, is just as great as it was then. Rupert Murdoch, who obviously was the, the villain of the Wapping dispute, is still with us, is still cozying up to, well, our leaders are cozying up to him. <laughs> um, and, of course, we may have noticed that at Christmas, half the cabinet were at Rupert Murdoch's Christmas party. Um, as Michelle Stanistreet, the NUJ General Secretary, says in today's Morning Star, it's as if Leveson hadn't happened. It's as if all of that phone hacking scandal, which was only a couple of years ago, is, has just been completely swept under the carpet. Is it important that the press is so owned by only a handful of people? It is important. We all saw over the last parliament, the monstering of Ed Miliband, we saw the slander against the Labour Party, we saw the ease with which the Conservative Party was able to spread the myth that public spending was responsible for the economic crisis, and that has contributed to the Conservative victory in the election and the renewed assault on our class and on trade unions, the attempt to effectively ban uh, strike action which is going through in the trade union bill, as well as the redrawing of the political map which is going on in Parliament. Um, that monstering has been continued since the election of Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party. And he has been, the Labour Party has been portrayed consistently as chaotic, divided, sniping at itself, at a time when actually the Conservative Party is equally divided. We have cabinet ministers openly defying David Cameron on the issue of the European Union, but they are not portrayed in anything like the same light as the Labour Party. That is the influence of a corporate-owned press and a press dominated by a handful of press barons. The Morning Star is the only newspaper that supported, the only daily newspaper that supported Jeremy Corbyn's um, leadership bid, at least yeah, Britain-wide, I should be fair and admit that the Scottish National also did so. But that is because the Morning Star is not owned by a corporate press baron, it's because it's the only cooperative paper there is. And we're owned by our readers, and for a pound, you can become an owner of the Morning Star. And I know many people in this room are already shareholders. And you can vote at our AGMs, pick the management committee, and own your own paper. If that's not a way to hit back at people like Murdoch, who own most of our press, I don't know what is. It's really important that we have our own media, because we can try to counter the, the slander that's, that's being directed at Jeremy and the left of the Labour Party but also start to articulate a different and more positive vision. The rest of the media portray politics in a very, very distorted, through a very distorted prism. So for example, if you were to list Jeremy Corbyn's policies, quite a few of those policies, such as bringing the railways back into public ownership, or renewing Trident, 
are either supported by big majorities of British people, or at least by, in the case of Trident, it depends on the poll, but 50-50 is a reasonable guess. But the way he's portrayed is, is that these policies are totally crazy, they're completely out there. And that's a result of the way that power works in this country. The ruling class is obviously scared of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, all of these people saying he's an unelectable joke, if he was an unelectable joke, then they wouldn't be taking the extreme measures that they're taking at the moment to permanently move the goalposts in British politics. The Conservative Party's trade union bill contains clauses which are designed to financially pummel the Labour Party, basically take away what's estimated for around six million a year. Um, I know that, that was set back in the House of Lords recently, so we don't know exactly what's going to happen there. But the Conservatives are trying to sabotage the finances of the, the opposition. They're pushing through a voter registration change, which is designed to drop the poorest people and youngest people off the, the vote electoral registers. Um, they are also, because those people obviously are more likely to vote Labour, they're redrawing constituency boundaries in a way which is likely to benefit their own party, and of course they are trying to make promote many forms of trade union activity illegal. These are not the acts of a Conservative Party that is confident it can see off Labour at the next election. It's having to cheat. And that, I think, should give us some hope. The Morning Star. I've said that I think it's important because we're able to project a, a, a very different perspective from the rest of the press. And that is beginning to be appreciated. I mean, it's been appreciated for years in the trade union movement, but it's beginning to be appreciated elsewhere. And Paul said that all newspapers in Britain circulation is declining, but since last year that's no longer true of the Morning Star. In, from May last year, after about 10 years in which we were slowly losing readers, we started to go in the other direction. And by the end of the year we were about 15% higher than we had been in May in terms of daily print sales. And that doesn't include sales of our electronic edition which are also rising. So that's a really positive message that actually People are hungry for an alternative, but this alternative is still not obvious enough, it's still not strong enough. There are huge numbers of people who've never heard of the Morning Star, particularly people flocking in to the Labour Party, which of course has had hundreds of thousands of new members. And I see the role of the Morning Star in this particular crisis as one, essentially as a, as a link, link up between the trade union movement and all of these new people who are coming into the Labour Party. Many young people are not brought up understanding about trade unions and understanding the importance of trade unions. The Morning Star has to be that link and be that educating force, but we need to be getting out there. We need to be at momentum meetings and people's assembly meetings and local Labour Party meetings and meetings like this, explaining to people that this, there is a paper that's on their side and there is one paper that is supporting the leftward shift in the Labour Party and does want to see radical change in Britain. So um, I hope that, that, well, that's going to be the political sort of priority for us over the coming year. In terms of the online edition, yes, uh, we have made some progress with social media and, and with our website, but our website remains primitive by the standards of most of the national press. We have raised money from various, uh, various donors for a revamp of that, and we hopefully will sign a contract by the end of the month to have a total revamp of our website over the coming year by a Danish company that has done it for one of our partner newspapers abroad, did a very good job for them. And we're hoping that that will, once the Morning Star has a website that is more functional, is able to function sort of, um, maybe not 24 hours a day, because there aren't very many of us in the office and we don't want to stay there all night, but um, <laughs> that functions more in real time, because often at the moment we're, we're breaking, you know, we get stories at the same time as other newspapers, but they're able to push them out as soon as they get them and we're waiting till the following day's print edition before we release them, which means that in the increasingly important world of social media, where people are sharing what's just broken, we're not being shared as much as other papers, and that's another big technical challenge for us. But we remain, you know, a paper that operates on a real shoestring. We, um, we still run at a consistent loss and depend on our readers donating and so on to, to support us. We don't get the kind of advertising that other newspapers do, which is why, um, uh, we're probably the only daily paper that gets most of its uh, income from sales, which is why I would say it's very important that people buy the Morning Star. And I hope that um, I hope that if anybody here is not already a reader, that they would consider taking 
buying a copy today and taking a look and seeing if it's something that they would like to read in future. Thanks.